This is Deconstructing IoT. Here's part one of our two-part interview with Dr. Anthony Townsend, Senior Research Scientist at the Rudin Center for Transportation Policy and Management. Hope you enjoy it. Hi, it's Vaughn and Claire from Timbu for Deconstructing IoT. We're here today with Dr. Anthony Townsend, Senior Research Scientist at the Rudin Center for Transportation Policy and Management. Dr. Townsend was previously the research director for the Institute for the Future, is a founding member of NYC Wireless, which pioneered efforts to put free Wi-Fi in public spaces, and is author of the book Smart Cities. Thank you so much for talking with us. You recently left your position with the Institute for the Future to pursue your research with Rudin full-time, and um, I was wondering if you could share with our viewers a bit about your current research and how it's shifted. Yeah, so basically I spent the last year looking at how digital um, technologies are changing mobility and transportation. We've seen um, you know, a lot of interest around self-driving cars from Google and now Apple is talking about it, um, car manufacturers. Uh, a lot of it's hype and a lot of it's going to take 10 or 20 years to really play out in the marketplace. But in the meantime, startups are doing lots of really interesting things with apps, with uh, small connected devices, with um, things you can stick in a diagnostic port on your car and put your car on the internet. Um, and they're changing the way people make decisions about where they want to go, when they want to go, how they coordinate with their friends and family uh, and colleagues. And um, you know, really, um, I think, allowing people a lot more flexibility in the way they, they get around a city on a given day. Um, and so we spent a year kind of identifying hundreds of different technologies that were hitting the marketplace. Um, you know, everything from um, uh, self-balancing skateboards that use um, the same technology that was in the um, Segway to, um, you know, transit routing apps that help you um, figure out how to get from A to B on transit or on a bike share or whatever. Um, and really to, to um, develop four scenarios of the future of what we call reprogramming mobility um, that um, identify the technologies that people are using, the way that changes their behavior, the way that might change the transportation system, and then the, the effects that might have on where they want to live and work and the kinds of buildings that we build. And so it's really interesting. You know, some of the scenarios, um, you know, we imagined like self-driving cars allowing people to live, you know, three hours from the city because they won't care. They'll just play games or sleep or watch TV while they commute. Other technologies allow people to live in, in much smaller apartments. There's a big trend towards micro apartments now that are super connected and serviced by all kinds of delivery services and concierge services that they get over their phone. And so we might have more people living in, in denser central cities too. And the, the scenarios are just a way of exploring what the possibilities are. And then policymakers can say, well, we want that future, or we want this future, and these are the things that we have to do. So you've spent a lot of time researching the impact of technology on cities. What would you say makes a city smart? Yeah, um, the word smart is something that gets kind of bandied around, like sustainability or globalization. Like nobody really knows what they mean when they say it. Mm -hmm. um, I have a very specific definition that a smart city is a place where people, institutions, companies, government are using new digital technologies to sol solve timeless urban problems. And, and the digital piece is important because that's kind of the thing that's new on the scene. It's, you know, computation and data are like the new abundant resources of our age, um, people are, are using them to do all kinds of things they couldn't do before. But the, the timeless urban problem piece is important because you know, nothing's really changed. We still have to take out the trash, we have to police the streets, uh, we have to move traffic, we have to move freight through the city. And so um, you know, putting those two things together, I think, allows us to imagine a really different world. So you know, when other people talk about smart, they talk about things like bike lanes or um, you know, transit-oriented development or these kind of progressive urban design ideas. Mm -hmm. For me, it's about the technology, not because the technology is going to solve everything, but because the technology is a piece of every solution today. I mean, you can't imagine doing anything in a city without having some aspect of digital technology or network technology involved in it, because it adds so much value to whatever solution you're building. In your book, Smart Cities, you take a critical look at how technology is being applied to solve civic issues and urban challenges. 
what have you found to be some of the more encouraging applications of IoT technology? I mean, I think the, the big win for humanity um, in the long term is going to be around energy and, and resource management. So, you know, we know we're using fossil fuels and we need to shift our energy consumption. We need to be more efficient. We need to reduce energy consumption. Um, we know there's not enough water to accommodate all of the people who want to live on the planet. There's probably not enough land area to grow all the food we need. And so, um, you know, building um, uh, connected technologies, whether it's in a farm field or in you know, water mains or a smart power grid that allow it to be more efficient is something that we kind of have to do. And the planet just doesn't have the capacity for the number of people living the style of life that, that we anticipate. And that's sort of, um, I think, very much like the kinds of things that you hear coming from corporations that are trying to develop this market. It's like sort of bare bones, like heavy engineering behind the scenes, big capital investments over long periods of time. And that's all well. I mean, we know we have to do that. What I find a lot more interesting are the things that people are doing with IoT technologies, you know, in maker spaces and graduate programs um, and startups where they're creating entirely new services, entirely new products, entirely new ways of living um, that people find incredibly appealing. Um, you know, 10 years ago, it was only like media artists who would wear computers on their body. Now, you know, like you see like senior citizens wearing computers on their body. Um, not that that's necessarily in and of itself a good thing, but the services and the information that they're getting from it have value to them and, they, and they've decided that. So, um, of course, there's a lot of baggage that comes along with, um, you know, connecting everything in the world and, um, you know, there's... Um, Lots of researchers out there that are trying to figure out, you know, what does it mean that your refrigerator knows what's in it and where you are and can and can do things um, that we don't, you know, aren't sure like what the applications are. So design based on new technology can sometimes discount the needs of of individuals, whereas technology can also sometimes enable a collection of data that you know better informs design decisions and and research out resource allocation decisions. So for example, with car companies, uh, I know you've written about you know, their influence on city planning and how oftentimes that resulted in cities designed more for cars than actually for people. Um, at the same time now, you see companies, uh, for instance, Volvo is working with Ericsson to put sensors in cars so that it's reporting road condition information to uh, city officials in Stockholm so that they can better deploy uh, their, their uh, snow machines for the roads. Basically, I guess my question is, adding technology to city planning, do you think that just makes good city planners better and bad city planners worse? Um, I think that the, the thing that I was trying to steer people away from when I wrote the book, it was really, it was the thing that I was hearing from kind of big corporations like Cisco and IBM, that I reacted very negatively to was the notion that we would design or redesign our cities around digital network infrastructure, mm -hmm. around the internet, around technologies like um, uh, centralized command and control uh, analytics centers like IBM was proposing and built in Rio de Janeiro, or um, you know, uh, high definition video conferencing um, in some place like Shanghai, which was a scenario that Cisco presented. I mean, Shanghai is a city that's experienced tremendous disruption uh, in its population, very rapid development, breakdown of traditional family structures. And the idea you know, that they presented in this movie at the World's Fair there in 2010 was that like, we're gonna fix that all with Skype, basically. Was, and I just found that to be as overly simplistic and, and not looking long-term at the impacts and the shortcomings of that solution. It was basically, you know, the, the claim was like, just install this software, install this network, and we're gonna fix all your problems. We're gonna fix your education system, we're gonna fix your healthcare system, and, um, and fix your transportation system. And um, it just, it really uh, echoed with the kinds of things that GM was doing at the 1939 World's Fair in New York, where um, they sold a very compelling vision of what a future city based on automobiles would look like. And to a large part, you know, all the GIs came back from, from the war and built it. Um, and it's the source of so many problems that we have in the United States today. And I just kind of wanted to 
at least raise the question. You know, it might be too powerful of a force to really head off, um, but at least point to people and say, hey, this kind of looks like the mistakes that we made a couple of generations back, and we're still paying the price for it. In some of your other surveys of technological applications internationally, you discuss a few instances of the use of RFID. On one hand, in Songdo, South Korea, where it's been used to kind of inform the design of how people move about the city. And on another hand, in Zaragoza, Spain, where it's been used to provide access to goods and services for its citizens. And I uh, was wondering what you'd say about each approach and how one might more successfully align with people's interests than the other. Yeah, I mean, RFID is a weird technology. I think um, in many ways the market has almost moved past it, and the kinds of things that it was seeking to accomplish are being accomplished in other ways, right? So essentially it's about like, you know, tracking people. Um, I'm passing through this gate, or, you know, I want to pay for this transaction. Um, and I mean, just the array of technologies that are deployed in the marketplace um, that, you know, can be updated faster or can be um, uh, scaled faster or are more reliable in certain applications. Like, I mean, you know, you move like a crate of, or a whole pallet of, of uh, products that have an RFID past the reader at once. It's generally not gonna work, right? Like it can't scan the whole pallet at once. Um, but there are other technologies, maybe using machine vision to calculate the volume of the pallet and then identify the product from a barcode on the side that could do that much more effectively. Um, and so it's just an example of, I think, the proliferation of sensing technologies that are out there in the marketplace. Um, and you know, I think the issues that come up with something like RFID around like how, how, where are you gonna track individuals? How frequently are you gonna track them? How anonymous or specific is it gonna be who the individual is? are things that come up in every one of these technologies. Um, so there's been you know, a lot of um, examples of startups tracking people's Bluetooth and Wi-Fi beacons and their cell phone beacons as they move through, through the city. Um, and we've seen all different kinds of reactions based on is it a private space like a shopping mall or a public street? Is it um, in England or the United States? Um, is the application you know, uh, something to do with law enforcement or advertising. And um, the way people, you know, weigh the pros and cons in this trade-offs is just different in every context. Do you think the, uh, the thing that's putting kind of a bad taste in people's mouths is the idea of tracking or that it might not be anonymized? You know, it's different, I think, in every context. I kind of think of it very generally, like um, globally, like the EU, it's kind of err on the side of caution and don't collect data and be very um, aggressively protective of individual privacy. In some place like East Asia, like expectations of privacy and the government or corporations monitoring you, they're, they're really much less developed. And so people never really expected privacy, particularly in public space. Um, and then you have the United States where people are just kind of like, well, am I gonna get something valuable out of exposing myself and sharing my data in that way? much more pragmatic, like almost down to like a service by service, transaction by transaction basis. Um, and I think that's why location-based services have flourished here, because people are much more willing to, to give it a shot than to kind of knee-jerk push it away um, or just like roll over and, you know, let all their data be harvested. So that tension, I think, has been really productive because it's allowed for innovation, but it's forced companies to periodically deal with some very legitimate privacy concerns. So you've suggested that uh, smart cities be built more as a web rather than an operating system. Could you unpack that metaphor a bit? Yeah, so um, I mean, the, the simplest way of thinking about it is um, the, a smart city is essentially a kind of computer. Mm -hmm. um, it's a computer that happens to have all these, um, you know, physical objects connected to it, whether it's pipes or cars or buildings. Um, and from an information architecture point of view, from a kind of um, computer engineering point of view, you can either put all the intelligence in one place, like a mainframe, or you can distribute it, which is sort of like the world of personal computing in the web. Um, although in many ways you could argue the web is turning back into a mainframe. Um, you know, something like 20% of internet traffic is just running around inside Google's 
LAN, like from data center to data center. Um, like it's amazing centralization that's going on. Um, but I think the IoT is actually gonna push it back in the other direction um, because a lot of the companies that are particularly on the hardware side, it's in their interest to have a lot of silicon out there at the edges to have you know, 50 CPUs in your living room instead of one um, doing all kinds of clever things. Um, and from the designer's point of view, it's great to have that intelligence at the edge because you can all of a sudden, you know, you're playing with a very intelligent device that can do all kinds can recognize faces, you know, it can it can learn your language, um, things that you probably can't do if it's just like a, a tiny little processor sitting there. Um, it also solves some of the architectural issues of pushing data up into the cloud. So I don't have to send the whole video stream from the camera, I just send the faces, the, you know, the identification of the faces that I picked out or whatever it is. Um, and so you don't get some of these bottlenecks in the, at the edge of the network that you might get. Um, and that's, so that's kind of like one um, technical piece of it. But from, a, from like an economic innovation point of view, um, the idea of lots of little pieces joined together by essentially ad hoc protocols is how, that's how the web was built. It was built on the fly. There's a lot of pieces of it that are fundamentally flawed. Eventually, we'll probably fix those. Um, but that messiness has allowed anyone to participate um, at many points in history, um, as opposed to the operating system or mainframe approach where there's, there's one entity, like a Microsoft or, or whoever it is, who uh, holds the keys to the castle. And you can't process a subway payment transaction unless you go through their system. You can't open a door in a building unless you interface with their system. And I think, you know, everything's going to be built around APIs, around services that, that um, you know, people who connect software to that physical infrastructure can provide. The question is whether we do it all in one piece of unified software or we spread it out. Um, and I think it's going to be more difficult to spread it out, but potentially a lot more democratic, a lot more innovative, probably more secure, probably more resilient in a crisis. Um, and the whole kind of hype around cybersecurity right now that um, is starting to happen, um, you know, hasn't even begun to explore like how frightening it is if we extend our present security framework to the Internet of Things, because it's like I mean there have been reports um, of like Internet connected uh, irons with um, spam, you know, Trojan horses on them, right? So like. The Russian spam network is running off of, you know, 10,000 uh, internet-connected irons in Scotland, right? I mean, the vulnerabilities there, I think, are something that, um, you know, a lot of, I think, you know, again, the big silicon manufacturers are, are really, really concerned with, can they get the security model and the privacy model right, like literally down, as soon as the sensor senses something, encrypt it, encode it, lock it down, and push it to wherever you need to push it to, but you can't, you can't let it get off the chip in an unsecure fashion. Um, and I think that's, that's a totally different way of thinking about security than, than we do now, but it's really the only way it's gonna work, I think. Or, you know, I mean, we could have catastrophic failures. Um, you know, there have been attacks on urban infrastructure systems. Nothing catastrophic so far, but it's almost like the hackers are trying to prove to themselves that they can do it. Have you um, come across any IoT applications or ideas for IoT applications that you feel like really fit in with this model of, of the web rather than the OS? Yeah, I um, so I'm an advisor to a, um, <clears throat> a venture fund based out of Miami called Urban.us. And um, they have been essentially looking at the success of things like Nest and going around and saying, well, like, what are all the other parts of the world where people want intelligence and connectivity in the hardware of the world. Um, and so they have a startup that's doing uh, basically a nest for your water sprinkler. Um, they have another one that's doing like a nest for your old fashioned radiator, um, you know, not one that's connected to a digital thermostat. So <clears throat> I think there's so many different compelling applications. Um, they do a conference every April that's coming up down in Miami and they just sent out the email yesterday with like, all the toys that they're going to have, and if you know CES was all about the IoT this year, and it's um, I think what's really interesting is just the um, the the kind of design thinking that's being unleashed. 
that I don't think anybody really knew was there, that like there were all these people who wanted to work in hardware who just couldn't because it was too complicated or not ready for production. You know, like, so we had Arduino, that's fun for learning, it's fun for tinkering, but you're not probably gonna like ship a device that's based on that. Um, interest in design, um, the rapid fabbing capabilities that are available now that allow people to build high quality hardware quickly um, and ship it. I mean, it's just amazing, like the things that are coming out of the woodwork. So much more accessible now, it's incredible. Yeah. Yeah. Um, that concludes part one of our interview with Dr. Anthony Townsend. Be sure to watch the second part to learn about the perils of privately owned algorithms, the creation of chief resilience officers, and how to become an urban planner for smart cities. Thanks.